at number 10, Latin. Out of all of the dead languages, Latin is probably one of the most well known. You might be saying, well, it isn't completely dead because Latin is still somewhat around in society. While you do have a point, Latin is still considered a dead language because no one speaks it. It is still used to classify animal species and science and is also used in medical terms as well, but you won't hear someone speaking Latin just out and about. The most Latin that the average person would use in normal everyday speech would be saying some kind of Latin phrase like carpe diem, which means seize the day, or memento mori, which means remember you must die. Certainly not as upbeat as carpe diem, but it's still got the same principle. These days, the only country that uses Latin as their official language is the Vatican. And yes, for those who never knew this, Vatican City is its own country. The reason why Latin is their official language is because the Holy Scriptures are written in this dead language. They are the only ones who have kept up with it after the language started dying out after the fall of Rome. At number 9, Sanskrit. The ancient language Sanskrit is the oldest language in the world, but unfortunately the language died out around 600 BCE, so a very long time ago. Though it died out so long ago, it still seems to be holding on a little bit, even in modern day in some countries. Currently, Sanskrit is considered one of India's official languages because of the fact that many ancient scriptures regarding Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism are written in this ancient language. Sanskrit also holds on to a lot of popularity among scholars as it is a popular study for many students because of its ties to many ancient philosophical works like the spiritual and medical theories written by the popular philosopher Vedas. On number 8, Ancient Greek. Up next we have a pretty special language, this being Ancient Greek. Many people still study some Ancient Greek because of the works of some of Ancient Greece's most famous philosophers like Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and Homer. On top of that, much like Latin, many scientific terminologies are written in Ancient Greek. Now, I mentioned that this is a pretty special language, so let me tell you about what makes it so unique. The death of ancient Greek is pretty special because it didn't necessarily die out completely. Strange, I know. You see, rather than the language dying out completely, it simply got transformed into what we now know as modern Greek. So really, it's not exactly the same, but it just evolved into something new. Now, modern Greek is used as the official language of Greece. Even though the language, or rather some of its remnants, are still around, ancient Greek is still studied to this day, and fun fact, many words from the English language are derived from ancient Greek. At number 7, Biblical Hebrew. The death of the Biblical Hebrew language is a pretty sad one. There are many ways for a culture or language to die out, and most times it has to do with some kind of conflict, overtaking, or assimilation. In the case of Biblical Hebrew, this language died out in the 20s century due to warfare and persecution. Biblical Hebrew initially saw its decline after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, but after the events of World War II and the persecution of the Jewish population, Biblical Hebrew lost any hope of returning. Most of the rabbis who could have passed along this language died during the war, and so this ancient 8,000 word language transformed into modern Hebrew. It is still possible to learn the language, but no one really uses it anymore. One cool thing about learning this language though is the fact that it would be a much easier language to pick up than any other dead language. At number 6, Old English. Obviously, we need to talk about the language that came before ours, that being Old English. This is the language that came before the modern English that we speak today, and even before the middle and early modern English that you may be familiar with if you ever had to study Shakespeare. It was the first recorded stage of the English language that was used and spoken up until approximately the 1150s. Old English had three genders to the language, masculine, neuter, and feminine. Old English, also referred to as Anglo-Saxon English, was spoken by people in England and Scotland, hence the name. Eventually, it evolved into a more grammatically correct version of English that we call Middle English, and this old form quickly died out, giving way to this newer version. The English language has undergone a lot of transformation over many years, so I wonder if you'll see another transition in this language in the future. At number 5, Coptic. When you think of the ancient Egyptian language, you would probably imagine the hieroglyphs that these ancient people were known for. Coptic was actually the final stage of the ancient Egyptian language before it was replaced with Arabic, and it was written using the Greek alphabet. Coptic was also considered to be the first ever Christian language. 
It was created as a result of four different languages, those being Greek, Demotic, Hieratic, and the Hieroglyphs. For some time, Coptic was preserved as a religious language, but it died out after about 300 years. There are no languages out there that are even close to Coptic, making this one very unique. At number 4, Ayapaneco. Now this next language isn't exactly extinct, but it is severely endangered because there's only a small handful of people left in the world who still speak it. Ayapaneco is a critically endangered language that originated in Tabasco, Mexico. From what I understand, there are only two native speakers of this language left, but the issue is that those two people refuse to speak to each other and no one knows why, which is a bit mysterious. People say that they just don't get along, but again, the reason for that is unknown. The reason that this language has pretty much died off is because of the severe lack of native speakers. This is all thanks to 20th century Spanish educational reform, where children were forced to not speak in any other languages other than those which were approved. It's so sad that this language has pretty much gone all because of outsider influence. At number 3, Aramaic. This next language is pretty special because it's one that is said to have been spoken by Jesus Christ himself. The Aramaic language was, in its heyday, the primary language because it was so widely used. This language is also the one that replaced the highly complex Akkadian language, which we will talk about in a few moments. There are Aramaic speakers, but none of them actually came from the country which this language originated. This dead language came from Aram, but the country fell to the Assyrians back in ancient times. However, despite the destruction of Aram, their language remained fairly intact as the Assyrians used it as a second language given its significance and popularity since it was the lingua franca of the Middle East. The reason that this language eventually died out was due to the diaspora of the people who spoke it. There was a point where some researchers feared that the language would be gone by the next century. However, thanks to the historical significance of the language, as well as the texts that still need to be researched in its language, Aramaic still remains preserved, unused but not completely lost. At number 2, Old Norse. Now let's talk about the language that was used by one of the most interesting civilizations from the past. We all know about the Vikings. We've done a few videos about them on this channel so far, but no one has really talked about how they spoke, so let's get into it. The Vikings spoke Old Norse. It was unique to the Vikings, but it ultimately died off in a similar way to the Aramaic language. As the Vikings split off and became individual groups like Icelandic, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, and Faroese, the language kind of just faded away over time. Though the entirety of Old Norse has been lost for the most part, some remnants still remain in the English language. Since both Old Norse and English stem from the Germanic family, they share similarities and this is how we got words like cake, knife, and berserk. They came from the Vikings. On top of that, the word Thursday came from the Vikings Thor's day, as in the god, and the word husband came from Old Norse as well as it was a mashup of the words hus and bondi. And finally, at number one, Akkadian. The ancient language Akkadian originated in Akkad, an old Mesopotamian city from ancient times. This language was actually the first certified Semitic language in history. If you learned about Mesopotamia, then you would probably be familiar with its written form of the language called cuneiform. Akkadian was spoken by the likes of Mesopotamians, Babylonians, and Chaldeans. But unfortunately, due to the language's inability to evolve, it ultimately died out, as I mentioned when talking about Aramaic, since that language was the one to replace Akkadian. This language is very much dead, unless you want to learn cuneiform, which in that case, you'd have to learn Akkadian as well. At number 10, Treaties of the Vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I for one would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the Treaties of the Vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is, and the Treaties of the Vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number 9, 
and Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lots of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the Archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far, and while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. Item number 8, Liber Lintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text's meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etrusian language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number 7, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands, and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas, and after being translated, might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number 6, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art, turn out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. At number 5, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Counsel, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two hero twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the lord of the underworld. 
The earliest surviving copy of Popova dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 70 CE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number 2, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun! That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250 page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language or code or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is an alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? Right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. You have to list at number 10, their formation. The pyramids of Giza, as fascinating as they are to look at from the ground, have an even deeper meaning from above. Located in northern Egypt on a plateau just west of the Nile lies perhaps the most fascinating structure created by humans. The northern pyramid, the oldest one as well as the largest, was built for the King Khufu. He was the second king of the fourth dynasty. This one, like I said, is the biggest pyramid. So when we imagine the pyramids together, this is what we have in our brains. The big, massive Goliath right there. A little white tip at the top. The next pyramid was built for King Khafre, the fourth king of the fourth dynasty. The southern pyramid was for King Menkore, the fifth king of the fourth dynasty. Also the last pyramid to be built. Their connection to the cosmos really took flight back in 1995 in a book called The Orion Mystery. 
Robert Bavel pointed out the formation of the pyramids also just happened to align with the three stars of Orion's belts in the Orion constellation. This is the plot of Transformers 2. So yeah, people have really ran with this idea since then. There's nothing in Egyptian texts that have proven this at all in any way, shape, or form, but this list may change your mind. Cosmic coincidence, perhaps. Number nine, dung beetles. Dung beetles, yeah, also known as scarabs, but also known as dung beetles, so we're gonna definitely call them dung beetles. They're the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. How weird is that? A lot of animals have these natural instincts, right? Some animals follow the sun, sea turtles instinctively sprint to the ocean the second they're born, you know, to avoid getting plucked by giant birds from the skies. They do it naturally. These beetles would naturally follow the line of the Milky Way, and then they would also roll their dung towards it. They would just, listen to what I just said, dung beetles instinctively follow the cosmos rolling their poop. They're just like, I must go back. We got a whole poop galaxy. So bum bum beetles are trying to phone home, apparently, I don't know. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there's a massive scarab monument. A poo-poo buggy monument, just right there. There's even a legend still to this day behind that statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. You would just become a white girl's Instagram if you walked around it nine times. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun, but it was also known as the scarab-faced god. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but I just watched too much Teletubbies, that's probably why. Are these bugs just trying to go home to their bug alien poop master? Why does there need to be so much poop? Where are they going? Why are they in a rush? Whatever DIY project is going on on that planet, just leave me out of it. Number eight, King Tut's dagger. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found a dagger that was buried with the king. Now, it's important to note that it's not uncommon to be buried with your belongings. It's why these tombs were built in a certain way, these big, massive, monumental ways. So grave robbers, any Nicolas Cage guy caught snooping around with a torch, they'd get trapped, ideally. They can't just steal King Tut's dagger, right? Even if you have the declaration of yada yada. No, you can't go in there and monologue your way to this treasure. This one dagger is quite the mystery though. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable x-ray fluorescence spectrometry, which is a mouthful, a lot of air just left my body. But according to the Journal of Meteorites and Planetary Science, King Tut's dagger is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting this material came from meteorite. So when people say the pyramids were made by aliens, it's laughable obviously, but evidence like this just fuels that fire. I don't know, do you believe now that I said that? Number seven, the black tomb. Back in 2018, remains were found by archeologists. They found this massive black granite sarcophagus in Alexandria and hadn't been touched in over 2000 years. So we decided to open it. We opened it and we found three skeletons. And we also found this brown reddish sewage water. It was horrible. Skeletons and sewage water, it's a bad combo. You know, they were half expecting gold or some sorts, but no, nope, not this time. They opened it up two inches only and the smell was so foul, everybody just ran away. Egypt's Ministry of Antiques Committee just ran away. They needed gas masks to go back. What a red flag that is. Nine feet long and five feet wide. It's just pretty much just a big granite bathtub full of bones at that point. There were also three inscriptions. That's the mystery part. There were these drawings on these small sheets of gold. One resembled a seed pod of an opium poppy inside a shrine of some sorts. The other is a snake, an unhooded snake, usually connected to the goddess Isis. The same god that Cleopatra embodied, but we'll talk about that more later on. The last one is a palm branch or corn or something like that. Experts believe it's related to themes of fertility and rebirth. Or some guy just like corn. One of the two options. I vote the first, but you never know. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, said in response to locals freaking out that we've opened it and thank God the world has not fallen into darkness. I was the first to put my whole head inside the sarcophagus and here I stand before you. I am fine. Whew, nice. Only that was back in 2018 and a few things have happened since, so mm, did we really make it unseathed? I don't know, unseathed, is that a word? Number six, 2020 mummies. Yeah, as if 2020 wasn't stressful enough, we also found more mummies. I'm glad Brendan Fraser is returning to Hollywood because it sounds like we're gonna need them pretty soon. This is alarming. While we were stuck inside watching Netflix and chilling, more than 100 sealed coffins were found in Egypt. The findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations, like Persians and the Greeks. These coffins were still occupied and untouched for that long. The discovery has taught us that the Saqqara was pretty much the main burial site of the 26th dynasty, including the first known burial pyramid. That entire piece of land honestly is so intriguing and just interesting. I wanna know what's hiding in Egypt, at the same time, I don't. 
You know what I mean? Number five, Sun God Origins. One of the most interesting facts about all this and everything with the queens and the kings of Egypt is the impact that they had on religion. Both Queen Nefertiti and King Akhenaten were in a cult, believe it or not, the cult of the sun god Aten. Now, in the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aten was now Egypt's main god, and the queen, Queen Nefertiti, was a stepmother of King Tut, so her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was a small window where Nefertiti ruled as a pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe that Nefertiti was a co-ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we just don't have enough evidence quite yet. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Kind of important. Number four, Queen Nefertiti's death. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Out of the blue, all of a sudden, just like that. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped off the face of the planet. Her whole legacy just gone. She was gone from everything. Many believe she didn't actually die in this case, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. She just, she's the man, the whole world. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. So is that really a Nefertiti disguise? Perhaps. I sure hope so. That'd be pretty sweet if we proved that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. You gotta fool your followers. This is a while back. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth back in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdu el Damadi found what they thought was a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contained the sarcophagus of the queen. Number three, KB 55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB 55, was found by Edward Ayrton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than by a name is because we really don't know who was inside. Even the walls of the tomb inside, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off. It's just bare for the most part. The only hint as to who is buried remains on these walls. There's one hieroglyph that remains. That hieroglyph was discovered in 1907, and it translates to, the evil one shall not live again. That's creepy, okay. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out of the tomb. Yeah, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. You can't have grave robbers come in. This one, you can't have anything get out. Must have been pretty bad. The description for those inside the tomb had also been destroyed, so we have literally no idea who was in there, or what. Many believe it's Akhenaten, and back then, they didn't believe in multiple gods, just one, so Akhenaten may have gotten off on the wrong foot with the high priests, and over his 17 years of ruling, he was convincing everybody that their art and religion was wrong, and the only god in existence was the sun god. His own son, King Tut, succeeded him and luckily restored the previous religion, but an empty tomb? I feel like we're missing something here. A major part of the story, I feel like it's just, mm, slide that in, and then we'll figure it out. Number two, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty. While it's not as flashy or as massive as the other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing in the religious world, the Pyramid Texts. These texts go back to 2400 BC. Those are some old texts, it's like some BBM type texts, that's how old we're talking here. These Pyramid Texts were specifically written so that this King Teddy could ascend to the heavens after his death. There are also spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos afterwards. More specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. Maybe the pyramids are in fact a gateway to the cosmos. Maybe those beetles were onto something. And finally, number one, Lord Nefertiru. For this next mystery, we'll be looking at the land down under. We're looking at Australia. Yeah, it connects to Egypt. You'll see. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past, right? There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to speculate. It's fun to find UFO looking objects hiding in them or like helicopters. That's part of the fun to speculate and wonder because we really don't know anything. We don't even know what's in our ocean, let alone what happened thousands of years ago. So when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, Australia, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning, right? Like the Gosford Glyphs, for example. They were discovered in 1970s at Karyong, and there's about 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. 
Those hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt's. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, those Milky Way, you know, bugs. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member, Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some tales telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodies. Of course, that always does. Some of the Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, but most of them are just scarabs, birds, and sun symbols that popped up as well in Egypt. But how can they possibly be connected that far away that long ago. That's the mystery.